Hello, everybody. It's me again, here to do the think about checklist while reading. The Daily Me is neither new nor bad. Written by Eduardo Hauser in the New Huffington Post, May 2nd, 2009. Once again, these things are really old. Okay. So paragraph one, certain journalists have recently express, expressed a fear of a new trend they believe threatens their already struggling institutions. The growing news personalization websites that Nicholas Necroponte of MIT coined the daily me. But they shouldn't be scared. This trend isn't bad and it isn't new. In fact, far from being an enemy to news media, the daily me trends helps to save journalism. Okay, needless to say, since I agreed with a lot of the last article, um, we're probably going to get the point that I don't agree a whole lot with this article. One, true, this is not a new trend. As we talked about in the last video, or as I blathered about in the last video, we have always done choices in our media. We watched the TV news on one channel because we liked the anchors who were there, or we liked the way they presented things, or we liked the sports report better on that on that channel. But when we get into port for profit media, once again, we still have those same choices. I like listening to, I don't know, Anderson Cooper better than I like listening to Bill O'Reilly, who isn't on anymore. So that's kind of irrelevant. But we make those choices. We also make those choices if the media is going on and the news is in the background, whether we're listening or not. You know, um, if we get a beep on our phone telling us about a story, is it important enough to push, click and actually read about it? Is it? Is it not? So we've, we have always been that gatekeeper as to where we are going to spend our limited attention span. <laughs> okay, and then paragraph three. Oh, he also said, sorry, paragraph two also says, this is going to save journalism. Well, that kind of depends on how you define journalism. I define journalism as news put together by journalists who are professionals, who've learned to be professionals, who have a moral center where they decide that ethically they are going to try to take themselves out of the story and not be part of it. So as much as humanly possible to just present facts. And this is what happened. This is how this person reacted, this person reacted, this person reacted, and then this happened, okay? Because that's how I was trained as a journalist. So if we consider blog writers as journalists, and some of them are former journalists and still kind of to keep up with this. But blogs and blogs tend to invite more of that editorialism into them, and sometimes more than enough editorializing into it. Okay, so we need to decide how we're defining journalism before we're going to save it. All right. Paragraph three, critics of this phenomenon believe that giving us the power to become our own editors will encourage insulation and bias, but we have not always been on, but we've always been our own editors. Every time we consume media, we make choices consciously or not. When we skip articles, choose one newspaper over another, switch television channels or tune into a radio station, we decide what we want to consume. The internet has simply provided the tools to make the selection process broader, easier, and better structured. All right, so. True, we've been discussing that we have always been our, our own gate viewers when we choose media. And he's, now he's talking widely about media, television shows, radio shows. I don't know about you, but I don't tune into a radio show to listen to someone talk. Not really my thing, I'm, I'm more looking for music. But, um, you know, which, and I don't think any of you have ever really sat down and spent an entire evening reading a newspaper either because newspapers are dying. They're just not around as much as they were. Um, when you're switching television channels, I don't think you're severely debating, um, you're watching streaming services more than you're watching the actual TV channels. Okay, so this is, so he's taking all media and 
burying journalism and news into all media. So yeah, we are always been our own gatekeepers, our own editors of what we like and what we want to do. But is it important that you actually bump into the things that are actually facts? And if that's important to you, then this completely personalized where an algorithm is going to send you exactly what it takes to get you to can engage. Two things get you engaged, something you love and something you hate. And lately, they tend to push that button on hate a lot more because you stay more engaged the more hateful you find something. Okay, so let's continue reading here. If and how you personalize your news experience is simply a question of new methods, not new habits. True, but the methods and the media itself have changed. All right. When readers actively select their own topics, as they do on the dailyme.com, for example, they are typically more engaged, not less, than those who rely slowly on the editorial choices made for them in traditional outlets. Specifically, Daily Me users who personalize their news view an average of seven pages per visit, or about double the pages viewed by non-registered users. Okay, one thing that we really need to talk about here is that Eduardo Hauser, who's writing this, owns the dailyme.com. So of course he's going to give it a really good show here because face it, this is not necessarily a fact-based article as much as it's a feeling-based article. True, if someone goes to a particular site and they want to read about that information, then that's great. They are probably going to be more engaged. I'm going here to read news now or read information now. They're probably going to do that more than if they just get that pop up on their phone, which they may just kind of glaze over and call it. So yeah, it makes sense that people who are going to a specific place to look for specific material are probably going to spend more time at that specific place looking at material than if something just kind of jumped up in our face without hitting us. <clears throat> so, paragraph six, there are other important advantages to personalization of news consumption. Few would argue, for instance, that it's, a, that it's better for a reader to have a superficial knowledge of a broad area range of subjects than a deep, up-to-date information from various sources on a subject of intense interest. Readers who suffer from diabetes, for example, might rely on a daily news site to collect relevant arguments from multiple sources in one sitting. Okay, yeah, well, this is a nice statement. Um, and true, having in-depth knowledge about something you care about is great, but it, to be a functional adult in the world today, you sort of need to have a super, that superficial knowledge of everything that's going on. Just so that you aren't going, hey, did you know that the world blew up yesterday? No, didn't hear about it. There are going to be times when the world comes to you and you look like a fool if you haven't bothered looking at any of it. Um, the other thing is up-to-date information from various sources. What are those sources? This is something that as a journalist, you're talking to all the time, same thing as a historian. What are these sources? Who are they? Why was this source written? Why was this thing written? And what are they trying to get out of it? Is it an active site like the, the American Medical Association or the Diabetes Association? Those would be good sites to be getting information from. I'm not sure I would necessarily believe the sites that I would find on a social media news site like Daily Me. Okay. Number seven, of course, the editorial choices of the professional news organizations also play a crucial role in informing citizens. And a good personalized news site will direct users to quality reporting from newspapers and other traditional organizations. After all, just because the medium is different doesn't mean we should accept standards below those set by professional journalists. Quality news personalization is not about breadth or depth, it's about both. And that is a lovely, lovely thought. And if they did actually enforce this, that you need to have two sources that corroborate stuff, um, reporting news training as a journalist um, a long time ago, 
you had to make sure that what you were going to report was valid, that you had corroborating evidence, something that would back it up more than just one person saying something. But even with traditional news organizations for the, the newspapers and things that are still surviving out there, the news is no longer being made the way it was. It's not just listening to having reporters listening to the you know cops on their cop radios. Um, a lot of times it's broken by people who are there. Um, going back to the shooting in Vegas about um, four or five years ago where the guy was in the Mandalay Bay just nailing people who were at a concert right across the way and killed a whole bunch of people before they got him. That was initially broken by people who were being shot at or were watching from a safe distance people being shot at. So it's the, at least in the United States, it is the average person out on the street being affected by the situation that is initially breaking that news story. Then you have this whole other clock that starts because of the traditional news source, you now need to be the first one out there with that information. And it's becoming more and more important that they be first, not that they're right, but that they be first. And it's much more common now to see retractions. Oop, yeah, we printed this article, but oopsie, it wasn't right. It actually should have said this. Um, that's not quality journalism. So, yep, they talk about quality news and personalization, but personalization, once again, should not be done for you any more than you should be watching CNN because you think it's the best thing since sliced bread. You should also be looking at other things like NPR or especially PBS. If you watch our national news, even on our four profit 24 hour news channels, pretty much Africa doesn't exist. Asia, for a great part, doesn't exist. We never have stories about them unless it is physically affecting us. It's watch PBS NewsHour one night just to see how different a presentation it really is. So while it's un sorry, paragraph eight. So while it's unnerving time for newspaper reporters to be sure, and many harm misguided skepticism about emerging news platforms, the industry should recognize that journalism isn't going anywhere. It's only the devices from which we consume content that are changing. And personalized news sites best serve those new devices by trimming the headline fat down to content manageable on small screens. Well, first of all, you can make the headline small. And the problem with this shift in the journalism industry is the fact that they, you have reporters, people who want to be out there reporting the news and would like to do a really good job on it, but there aren't places that hire them anymore. Um, really, unless you are pretty enough, to be on air talent, you do not tend to get hired in a TV environment. And radio news, as well as print news, which is where you used to get the most in depth information because, you know, little sound bites and bits that they're giving you on television are not telling you what's going on. They're telling you their choice of what's going on. I'll admit that even in professional journalism, there are. There's a reason they cut a story the way and the way they give you that seven second bit or 10 second bit. So yeah, if there were still standards in place, if there were still places that hired reporters that wrote like reporters and paid them on the days when they couldn't actually make a story and that's when you make a story. We now have journalists in the habit of needing to make a story finding something worthwhile that they can sell to one of these news sites. And that's not a really good way to have to survive. And it also definitely taints the kinds of news or news light that they're writing. Okay, so 
paragraph nine. But going a step further, there's a fundamental question to be answered. Are we better off letting others, namely news editors, choose the daily news dose based on the denominator of the audience? Of course not. Each of us has a responsibility to seek out and understand conflicting news. The daily me only makes this essential process much easier. Yeah, not really. There's only so much that they're going to actually have. Like I said, nobody talks about the entire continent of Africa, nobody. So, you really have to give, you know, world news needs to start talking about the whole world, right? And the other part is, is that, <laughs> hello, just went dark in the room. The other part being that we need to realize that in for-profit media, there is already some of that news editors, now there is news editors choosing because they're trying to please their advertisers. In most newspapers, pretty much were locally, local newspapers and the local people who wanted to advertise in newspapers did. Um, the only time you really saw the editorial content were on that op-ed pages, opinion and editorial pages. They didn't pick and choose news. They may have pick and chosen where it fell um, in the newspaper, whether it was on the front page, front page, but fold, somewhere in the middle, but pretty much in your average newspaper for the area which it was preserving or talking about, it did a pretty good job of in-depth covering just about everything. Whereas these, do, these different places do not. Okay, so paragraph 10, personalizing the news is not only a reality, it's a necessity. The internet, whether through search engines, news sites, portals, or different versions of the Daily Me, will give every journalist the ability to tell a true audience, to find a true audience, not defined by geographical location, but by shared interests. In short, it's the best way to empower journalists to do what they do best and win far more readers than newsprint can hope to reach. Well, true. The internet reaches a lot more people, but the internet is fracturing into different and different places. And once again, how can this journalist find a place where they can share their, their information now when everything is decided by different editors, like the editors at the Daily Me? If that won't make us all as informed, what will actually taking our heads out of the sand and doing our own research and listening to places, listening to sites like PBS that will give you information that you don't normally hear. Now, paragraph 12. Hauser, a media entrepreneur and recovering lawyer, is the CEO of DailyMe.com, a board member of National Public Radio and a journalism advisor at the Knight Foundation before starting the Daily Me. He spent seven years at AOL's Latin American division and previously was head of news, the largest television network in Venezuela. Okay, so he has some really good, how should we say this, editorial staff history and experience. But you'll notice it's only here in the afterward to the article does it that it says that he is the CEO of the Daily Me, Chief Executive Officer of the Daily Me. That should have been something considering he's selling it as something that's good should have mentioned early on that he had this conflict of interest. When there's this big a conflict of interest where you have a person who is the CEO of a website selling his website in the face of what appears to be a news story, this isn't a news story. This is an advertisement. It's called native advertising. And he does a lot of very vague statements. He equates media to journalism and there's no difference. There's a lot of stuff he does in here that is not comfortable and it's definitely not newsworthy. 
So considering what the other gentleman in the Daily Me announced early on that he, or at least in the middle of it, that there he admits that he does personal searching. This guy's acting like he knows nothing about this other than he thinks it's a good idea. And it's not until afterwards that in that little section that hardly anybody reads in the afterword of an article, does it say that he actually owns the site and therefore is selling it. So read the fine print. All right. There is the daily me, it's neither new nor bad in our think aloud section. 